Regular meeting number 50 will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. This evening, Council is pleased and honored to have uh, Pastor Michael Young, the Senior Pastor of City of Grace, to pray with us this evening. Pastor, welcome back to Council. Let us pray. Father, we come before your presence tonight and we give you praise. We acknowledge you, Lord, as being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we just thank you, Lord God, for your presence tonight. Now, Father, we pray tonight that you'll just fill this place with your wisdom. Touch our leaders, Lord God, who you've appointed and placed in these positions. Give them wisdom, Lord God, to lead God and direct our city. Father, we pray for the manifestation of your word that said that you want peace and prosperity in the city. Father, we claim that for the city of Columbus. Father, we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, President Hart. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. This week's Communications received by the city clerk's office are listed in the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other uh, comments we, uh, to be reported? Not at this time. Are there any resolutions by members of council, starting with President Pro Tem? Thank you, President Harden. Um, yes, I have a resolution tonight, and as I read it, I would like to invite representatives from the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center to the podium. Stacy Porter, Melissa Diaz, and Karina Pagal. I have resolution 0287X-2019 to recognize and celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first all-woman research team in Antarctica from The Ohio State University. In 1969, four women from the Institute of Polar Studies at The Ohio State University, now called the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center, became the first all-female team of researchers to work in Antarctica. They were geochemist Dr. Lois M. Jones, entomologist K. L. Lindsay, geologist Eileen McSavany, and chemistry student Terry Lee Tickhill. A trip to Antarctica is not something to take lightly, and the courage, dedication, resourcefulness, and perseverance these women displayed during their successful research expedition is deserving of the highest praise. The groundbreaking trip helped open doors for women scientists across the globe and served as an inspiration to women and girls of all ages to explore research and careers in science. It's important that we continue to tell this inspiring story. Gender disparities in STEM fields are still an issue that we are working to resolve to this day. I want to thank the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center not only for marking this anniversary and for supporting this expedition 50 years ago, but also for your ongoing work maintaining research excellence while fostering a collaborative an inclusive community of investigators. Understanding the seriousness of climate change, the challenges it presents, and our response 
is such an important public policy, excuse me, public policy issue for all of us to tackle. And I am grateful that we have such a tremendous local resource helping us in these efforts. Before I turn it over to these three women here today, um, who are not the same three women who went to Antarctica, <laughs> just to be clear, um, I would like to uh, move, well, unless there are any comments or questions, I'd like to move for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopted. Stacy, Melissa, and Karina, you have the floor. Karina Thank in particular. Thank you very much. Council President Hardin, President Pro Tem Brown, and members of the Council, on behalf of the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center and the organizing committee for this week's symposium celebrating 50 years of women conducting research in Antarctica, I would like to thank the Columbus City Council for welcoming us here today to receive this resolution. Your acknowledgement of this historic event and recognition of the important role that women play in science, research, discovery, and leadership helps us advance our mission as one of the world's premier polar and climate research centers. In 1969, the first all-female research team set foot in Antarctica and was led by Dr. Lois Jones, a researcher at The Ohio State University's Institute of Polar Studies. Members of this team included Kay Lindsay, Eileen McSavany, and Terry Lee Tickhill, and in the face of discrimination and prejudice, this team became the trailblazers for the future generations of women in the field of polar science. Funded by the National Science Foundation, the team traveled from McMurdo Base to the South Pole and Dry Valleys. Their research efforts focus on the geochemistry of weathering and the saline cycle in South Victoria land, which is in Antarctica. While the expedition received significant fanfare and news coverage at the time, the women themselves faced invasive questioning, logistical restrictions, and open hostility that are shocking by today's standards. On October 17th and 18th, the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center is hosting Women in Antarctica, celebrating 50 years of exploration. This is a symposium to highlight the accomplishment of these four women, as well as what has been achieved since then. Two members of the expedition will join the world-renowned polar researchers, historians, and others to discuss the challenges they have encountered as pioneers in the field. With issues of both gender discrimination and climate science extremely pressing in today's world, acknowledging these advancements is highly inspiring to young women, such as myself, my colleagues, and the generations to follow as we build a more inclusive community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Mitch Brown. Uh, thank you, President Harden. I have one resolution this evening. I'd like to invite Dr. Ash Panchel from the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, Alice Luce from the American Heart Association, and Assistant Chief Jeffrey Happ and Lieutenant Parrish from the Division of Fire to approach the podium. Resolution 0286X 2019 to recognize October as Sudden Cardiac Arrest Awareness Month where sudden cardiac arrest is the third leading cause of death in the United States, impacting over 350,000 people annually. And whereas in Columbus, almost 600 residents suffer from sudden cardiac arrest each year, and only about 12% survive. And whereas the most effective treatment for sudden cardiac arrest is early bystander intervention, if a victim receives CPR with or without rescue breaths, or receives defibrillation from an automated external defibrillator, the chances of their survival or recovery almost doubles. And where a sudden cardiac arrest can strike without warning and affect anyone, regardless of age or gender, in most cases the victim has no history of heart disease, and whereas the symptoms of sudden cardiac arrest include shortness of breath, fatigue, fainting, dizziness, heart palpitations, and chest pain, if residents recognize these symptoms, they should call 911 immediately and begin CPR. Whereas the Columbus Division of Fire, American Heart Association, and the American Red Cross provide information and training for residents to respond in case of sudden cardiac arrest, and whereas the free Columbus Division of Police Pulse Point app is a tool to increase survival of sudden cardiac arrest by alerting trained bystanders to respond in case of sudden cardiac arrest in their immediate area, now therefore be resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby recognize October as Sudden Cardiac Arrest Awareness Month 
and urges all residents of Columbus to learn and recognize the symptoms of sudden cardiac arrest and prepare for this event. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Adopted. And I'd now like to ask Dr. Pancho for a few words. Thank you, thank you very much. My name is Ash Pancho. I'm an associate professor of emergency medicine at Ohio State University. I'm also a board certified physician in emergency medicine and emergency medical services. I have spent my whole life focusing on improving the outcomes and the care of people in our community in the pre-hospital environment. One of the biggest areas that we've f seen real trouble about our community and other communities across the country is cardiac arrest. A lot of times we think that cardiac arrest and heart attack are really similar, but the biggest fundamental difference, when, when you have a cardiac arrest event, there's an electronic malfunction in the heart, and that malfunction causes your heart to stop, completely stop, arrest, and that becomes one of the things that we need to act on immediately. The resolution today is really doing a great job of really identifying for us the need that we have in our community. It is my pleasure to support the importance of awareness in our community concerning certain car sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrest. As, as, as the chair had spoken, every year 350,000 people suffer an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest event and less than 12% survive. The good news is that there is something we can do, a simple step, push hard and call 911. Right? And you can do, and the order is put, put, call 911 and push hard. And performing this easy technique of bystander CPR, like, like the chair has told us, will double or triple your survival. Now, if you add on to that the provision of an AED, the chances of survival increase tremendously because now you're putting people back into that normal rhythm that they need to survive. When all is said and done, when you are a bystander and you act, you step in and you do something right to help somebody, your hands suddenly in that cardiac arrest event become that person's heart. You are literally keeping this person alive so that they can get the help and the safety that they need. Here's the amazing thing. In, there, in cities in this United States, there are situations where if you are able to provide solid bystander CPR with unified system-based approaches to care, you can increase that survival rate from 10 to 12% all the way to 20 to 25%. That is what we're, well, that's what the goal here in Columbus is through the Heart Save initiatives and a lot of the initiative that the chair himself has put forward. But for today, the biggest thing and the thing that will start us all in the right direction is for us to all recognize a cardiac arrest event. So take action when somebody suddenly collapses. President Hardin, Chair Brown, and the rest of the council members, thank you so much for your time. Ms. Luce. Hello, I'm Alice Luce. I'm the Community Health Director for the American Heart Association. And on behalf of the American Heart Association, I'd like to recognize Councilman Brown and President Hardin and all the council members. And we appreciate this recognition of such an important initiative here in this community. And we also want to thank the Columbus Fire Department for all that they're doing to make this a reality. And I want to tell you all to take a hands-only CPR class. Thank you. Chief Hap? No. no, Chief Hap. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to force me. <laughs> First and foremost, thank you so much, President Harding and council members. Uh, it is amazing, the longer and longer that I've now been assistant chief for over a year, how Council Member Brown is constantly, uh, constantly <laughs> helping us to be better, uh, be, be better residents, better citizens uh, of Columbus. He has chaired this. Heart Savers Ohio and Columbus and has pushed us to be better uh, residents. So thank you so much for all your help and guidance. Thank you very much. Councilmember Dorn. Uh, thank you, President Hardin. I have one resolution this evening. Uh, this time I'd like to invite Race Director Darius uh, Blackford Ford to the podium as I introduce resolution 0288X-2019 to recognize Nationwide Children's Hospital's Columbus Marathon for celebrating racing in the community, exceptional fundraising, groundbre groundbreaking research. Nation Nationwide Children's Hospital is honored to be the title beneficiary for the Columbus Marathon and Half Marathon, and 2019 marks their eighth eighth year of this strong partnership. 
Uh, thus far, millions have been raised in the hospital, including more than a million dollars contributed since 2012 by the Columbus Marathon Board of Directors. Uh, the Nationwide Children's Hospital Columbus Marathon will take place this Sunday, October 20th. We encourage everyone to come out and support uh, folks who are running that race and certainly uh, help uh, celebrate uh, not only the folks who are out there uh, uh, running the race, but also for folks who are working to find uh, cures for the patients. Uh, I will actually be out there it's Sunday morning running the half marathon because the old joke goes, uh, I'm only half crazy. So um, with that, do any of my uh, colleagues have any questions or comments or would like to volunteer to join me on Sunday? <laughs> There'll be an AV of A. <laughs> Seeing none, I move for adoption. Second. Please, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Adopt it. Director Blackford, the floor is yours. There are still spaces available if any of you would like. Uh, so I stand here very humbly. Um, this is the 40th anniversary of the Nationwide Children's Hospital Columbus Marathon and Half Marathon. I was doing some quick math. Five Columbus mayors have uh, been in office during this event, hundreds of council members, thousands of police officers, firefighters, and city personnel have been involved in this race. And tens of thousands of people from around the world have come to our city. It was started in 1980 by city leaders who thought it would be an interesting way to get people to come and visit Columbus. And they keep coming back year after year. And as um, uh, Council uh, Member Doran said, um, this is the eighth year of our partnership with Nationwide Children's Hospital. Knock on wood, we're going to hit the $10 million mark in those wow. eight years. And it's just such a great community asset that we can partner with. And we're just uh, we're honored that the city and the surrounding communities continue to welcome us back every year. And I, I'm glad that you and others uh, find uh, joy and uh, enjoyment in doing the event. So thank you. That's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Dorans. Councilmember Favor. Thank you, President Harden. Uh, tonight I have uh, resolution 0290X-2019 to recognize October 13th to October 19th, 2019 as Fashion Week Columbus. I'd like to invite Thomas McClure, co-chair of Fashion Week Columbus and his colleagues to the podium. Fashion Week Columbus is the flagship pro program under the Columbus Fashion Week which produces a week-long showcase of emerging fashion designers to media, buyers, and the incredible fashion community in Central Ohio. The week-long event takes place annually and consists of fashion shows, entertainment, programming, and educational opportunities, including the awarding of a scholarship to a fashion design student. This year is the 10th anniversary for Fashion Week Columbus, and I'm excited to honor this group here at council today. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I would move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Adopted. Tommy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Council President Shannon Harden, Council Member Shayla Favor, and City Council members. Thank you for your time today. I'll keep this quick because I do want a few others to say a, just a few seconds of words with you. <laughs> this year, we're celebrating 10 years of Fashion Week Columbus, impacting lives on and off the runway. Since 2010, we have provided a platform for over 100 designers here in Columbus, some going on to New York Fashion Week, some going on to manufacturing their, their collections, um, all doing what they love and living here in this city. Um, we've worked with over a thousand models, some signing with major um, agencies, regional and uh, globally, and also a thousand volunteers, which some have found opportunities in the fashion industry due to us. Um, and also, you mentioned scholarships, over $25,000 worth of scholarships to fashion design students at CCAD. So earlier this year, my board of directors and I formed the Columbus Fashion Council, which will expand the vision and further the mission of Fashion Week Columbus to providing scholarships to fashion design students and providing a platform for locally based fashion designers. So now please hear from a few of those who have been impacted on and off the runway for Fashion Week Columbus, and I promise it will be short. <laughs> Good evening, President Hardin, President Pro Temp, 
Brown and the rest of our city council members. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Shayla Faber, for joining us yesterday for our kickoff at the high tea. My name is Lubna Najjar. I am the president of Tommy's amazing board <laughs> that he so amazingly put together when he founded Fashion Week Columbus 10 years ago. I was a success story and am a success story of Fashion Week when it started out as a week of entertaining events in a nonprofit fashion, helping designers build their businesses here in Columbus. Six years later, I ended up selling my brand to a very large company and starting a consulting firm that works nationally. So when I took on the presidency of this board, I made it my personal pro and professional mission to help other designers do that exact same thing. So when we think of Fashion Week, we're not thinking of just entertainment anymore. We're thinking of economic development. We're thinking of keeping your business in Columbus and helping grow our city, not just in the creative space, but in the business space. So thank you so much for supporting us and I will pass it over to Nia Noel, our co-chair of Fashion Week Columbus. I have to put this down though, or I'm shorter. <laughs> thank you so much, Council President Harden and council members. My name is Nia Noel and I've been on the Fashion Week Columbus board serving as the style director for five years and now the Fashion Week Columbus co-chair. I work with the designers all the way from the application process until their runway presentation and beyond. It is my pleasure to do this and truly a labor of love to guide these designers through many of them starting their career right here in our great city of Columbus. Your support and contribution to our organization is greatly appreciated. Good evening, my name is Gerardo. Um, I'm a fashion designer. I'm with Fashion, fashion Week Columbus for the past four years, and um, the best platform I've ever had, uh, Fashion Week, helped me to grow my business, my name, my brand, and now I'm designing for Nina West, and I'm a costume designer for Opera Columbus ah. next year. That's awesome. Thank you. Hello to the president, chairman, and council. My name is Arika Elliott, however, I'm better known in the fashion community as Ari Lexis. Um, first off, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to allow us to have this platform. As a veteran stationed here in Columbus, Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio, Fashion Week Columbus has brought me on board as a volunteer and as a student with the Veda Institute of Columbus. Since three years ago of me being a student for aesthetics, I was allowed the opportunity to work Fashion Week events. From there, I currently have the position of being the head beauty director for our liaisons of all of the hair with Veda Nurture, as well as other sponsorships that we have. If it wasn't for the opportunity presented to me, I would not have been able to travel to New York for Fashion Week for the recent collection, and I wouldn't have been invited back for February for the fall winter 2020 collection. This platform has helped show everyone in central Ohio and abroad that not only are we known for fashion, but we're known for our back of house representatives that make sure that our fashion shows are implemented. Thank you for your time. Good evening, President Hardin and council men and women. My name is Lisa Whittington and I've been in the cosmetology industry for over 39 years. Um, having Fashion Week, in our city is impacted me on many levels. Um, this is my third year and I am head hair lead um, with Fashion Week and I don't know what to say, it's just that it's fabulous. A lot of our co-workers uh, co with us have presented themselves really well. But for me, passion, um, fashion is my passion and hair is very much a part of Fashion Week. Um, Representing Nurture Salon is a salon that um, also is a sp sponsor. And for a hairstylist, that is huge. We get to do editorial and print work, and then also we get to do fashion runway shows. It's amazing, um, allowing us to share with our guests as well as enlightening them on fashion, what's going on in the city. So Fashion Week is one of the most amazing things for most cosmetologists and hairstylists here in the city. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I am Ken Swan Turner and I am one of the models for um, Fashion Week Columbus. And I started in 2000, I believe 2015 when I moved here from the state of Alabama. Um, when Tommy asked me to 
um, write up a few words, it actually came out two six pages long. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm not sure that we have that much time, mm. but um, <laughs> with that being said, I would like to express my appreciation for um, this platform. Um, I started modeling in Alabama, but when I moved here, um, I moved here for a degree, but at the same time, I wanted to continue to further my um, career in, in fashion and as a model. And um, that platform was perfect, and it, al it also came like right on time. So my experience as a model with Fashion Week Columbus and their etiquette for professionalism, always being on time, um, making sure that your designers and your clients are always appeased and happy. It was, it's, it's nothing short of amazing and I cannot thank you all enough for that. Hello, City Council President and City Council Members. My name is Sarah Song, and I am the show director and producer. Fashion Week Columbus helped me realize my potential and passion for executing beautiful and unforgettable events and experiences. Since my first directing debut one year ago at Fashion Week Columbus 2018 High Fashion Tea, which was one year ago yesterday, I will have directed my 25th fashion show and presentation by this Saturday at the Finale Runway Show. Fashion Week Columbus has been a wonderful platform for gaining experiences for me and has enabled me to get hired on larger productions such as working for Zach Brown Band and Lori Grenier of Shark Tank. I'm so grateful for all of the opportunities that Fashion Week Columbus has opened doors to. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. President Shannon Hardin, Council Member Favor, uh, Council Members, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for your support and recognition of Fashion Week Columbus and the Columbus Fashion Council. And we hope to see you at some of the events this week. We have uh, quite a few left, especially on Saturday, October 19th, our finale show. Thank you so much. Where can people learn more about what's happening this week? Most definitely, uh, fashionweekcolumbus.org. It's all right there on the events page um, in detail, yeah. So I did have an opportunity to attend high tea yesterday, and just when you think you're fashionable, you get in a room full of fashion folks, you realize you're really not that fashionable at all. But don't let that deter you. Don't let it deter you. You were very fashionable. Well, I tried. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That is all. Casper Remy. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. I'd like to introduce or invite Betsy Pandora and Mark Dravillis to the podium as I introduce ordinance number 291X 2019 to rec recognize October's National Planning and celebrate the National Planning Month and celebrate the Short North Arts District being named one of four great neighborhoods on the American Planning Association's annual Great Places in America list for 2019. In the 70s, the Short North was known as a rough, challenged neighborhood north of downtown with abandoned buildings and boarded up windows lining High Street. Community champions Sandy Wood, John Allen, and Greg Carr dreamed of a neighborhood that preserved the historic architecture and charm of Columbus landmarks and invited neighbors to visit something special. The Short North Arts District was soon born. October is designated National Planning Month by the American Planning Association. City planners, including private sector, volunteer, and public sector, have made major contributions to making the Short North a great place. These planners include the professional preservation staff of the Columbus Planning Division, who staff the Victorian and Itali Italian Village Commissions. The Short North has experienced a tremendous amount of growth in recent years, with preservation staff and commissions issuing thousands of certificates of appropriateness. This work has been a major contribution to making sure that the growth that has occurred is of the highest quality, indeed making the Short North a great place. The Short North Alliance is a nonprofit organization serving both the property owners and business owners of the Short North Arts District and work every day in the Short North to nurture the Arts District as a vibrant, creative, and inclusive community and leading arts destination. Columbus City Council is thankful for the impactful work of the Short North Alliance and excited to see the continued success of the Short North Arts District for years to come. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this Council does hereby recognize October as National Planning Month and celebrate the Short North Arts District as a truly great place as recognized this year by the American Planning Association. Betsy, Mark, the floor is yours. Council President Hardin, um, Council President Pro Tem Brown, and, and Council Member Remy and members of Council, thank you so very much for this kind resolution. Uh, on behalf of everyone in the Short North Arts District, from over 400 business owners, um, countless property owners, um, and individuals and organizations who have all contributed over 40 years to the growth and development uh, and improvement of the Short North Arts District, we are so thankful to be recognized uh, officially as a great place, though I think we all thought it was a pretty great place before this. Um, but it, it's a privilege to be able to serve folks in the neighborhood uh, personally, and uh, we're so very thankful to be recognized. So we, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Jeremy, Council President Hardin, all members of Council, I'm Mark Trevillis. So good evening, and thanks for this resolution uh, recognizing National Planning Month, and uh, congratulations to the Short North and its leaders for being recognized as a great place in America. Planning divisions continually engage with Columbus neighborhoods on all sorts of planning matters. A huge accomplishment in the last year was City Council adoption of Columbus Citywide Planning Policy, which we affectionately call C2P2, and is going to be a guide for uh, the next generation of growth in Columbus. So we wanted to note that tonight with Planning Month. It's, it's a major accomplishment for City Council and the city generally. Uh, design review is another really important aspect of the planning division's work, and as noted in the resolution, uh, with City Council's leadership and the design review conducted every month by the Victorian and Italian Village Architecture Review Commissions, it's been a critical aspect of creating the Short North as we know it today. We're really fortunate in Columbus to have many beautiful buildings, both old and new, up and down High Street that really makes the Short North the, uh, the great place that it is indeed today. Uh, thanks to the Short North Alliance again for its leadership and vol the vo our volunteer commissions and to City Council for your leadership on this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark and Betsy. I know uh, several of us judged at Highball this weekend. And uh, we, uh, we enjoyed that opportunity as we highlighted, you know, some of the fashion industry in, in that, that respect. Certainly a great event in the Short North. I know that every day that I walk down through the Short North, I notice something different and new. And it really, uh, it, it really shows Columbus is, is a, turning into a big city in, in some respects. So we thank you for your leadership and the things that you do. And certainly we appreciate the opportunity to celebrate National Planning Month. Are there any other questions? Questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Are adopted. <laughs> and that's all I have this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Remy. Well, um, it would not be October in Columbus if we were not uh, excited to recognize the Quarter Horse Congress and all that it means. So as I don my hat uh, and read Ordinance zero, uh, Resolution 0285X-2019 to recognize and celebrate the 53rd annual uh, anniversary of the All-American Quarter Horse Congress. Um, we want to rec well, welcome Dr. Keith Myers, er, or Scott Myers, and uh, the 2019-2020 Congress uh, Queen, Miss Mariah Shear. I was out uh, this weekend to uh, be a part of, uh, of um, your coronation as uh, this year's Queen. Uh, the reason this is so important is uh, the Quarter Horse, All American Quarter Horse Congress, is uh, a single breed horse show, and it's one of the largest single breed horse shows in the world, bring over 650,000 people to our city. Uh, it's an economic generator that contributes around 280 million, nearly $300 million to our city economy. And so if you have not been out to the Quarter Horse Congress, if you have not been able to see what this uh, amazing event uh, brings to our community uh, and, and all the activities, I, I can't encourage folks more uh, to go out there. Uh, I think I, I came back out there last night with my family just to go have dinner uh, uh, because there are so many food venues and, and, and others. Um, but it, it's a, it holds a special place in Columbus's heart, uh, and we are so grateful 
uh, for all that the Quarter Wars Congress is and does and has been. It is now woven into the fabric of Columbus, uh, and we are extremely, extremely grateful. And so uh, be it resolved by this Council of City Columbus that this council does hereby recognize and celebrate the 53rd anniversary of the All-American Quarter Horse Congress. Um, are there any comments from my colleagues? Thank you. Uh, we should have done this for the Fashion Week Columbus folks, should have said, you know. Um, Dr. Miles, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Dr. Myers helped me pick this out. So there's a lot of work that goes into shaping uh, and fitting a hat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Before we start, I want to let them fix the microphone. Thank you, Ms. Angie. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mariah Shear and I was recently crowned the 2019 Congress Queen. I am an Ohio native and went to school in your backyard at The Ohio State University. I am so proud to represent a nationally recognized organization and the largest single breed horse show in the world. We are so grateful for your support in hosting this prestigious event every year. Thank you. Congratulations. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, uh, I move for adoption. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you, sir. That's all right. And I have one more resolution. It's uh, 029. 2x-2019 is to endorse issue 10. It's the Franklin County Children's Services Renewal Levy on the November 5th ballot. Uh, would Elizabeth Crabtree, Director of the Volunteers for Children's Services, uh, please approach the podium. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Franklin County Children's Services provides protection and care for children in our community. 
who, observe, uh, who are abused or neglected. Each year, the agency helps more than 30,000 children by investigating allegations of child abuse and neglect, providing voluntary or court-ordered protective services to families whose children can remain safely in their, uh, in their own homes, helping parents to resolve family challenges and placing children in temporary foster care or permanent adoptive homes when necessary. Franklin County Children's Services has experienced increased need with opiate-related drug issues, accounting for 45% of new cases brought to the attention of Children's Services. So be it resolved by this City Council of the City of Columbus that th this Council hereby endorses Issue 10, the Franklin County Children's Services Levy, and encourages Franklin County voters to support our children at the ballot on November 5th. Are there any comments by my colleagues? See, uh, Director, would you, would you like to speak, uh, speak on the levy? Yes, thank you so much. Council President Hardin, Pro Tem Brown, council members and our community that we love. My name is Elizabeth Crabtree and I would like to, on behalf of Franklin County Children's Services, thank you for your support. Our mission is clear. We are mandated to ensure the permanency, safety and well-being of all of our community's children. And we cannot do this alone. As you said, we've seen an increase in the numbers that um, are coming to our door. The opioid epidemic has hit us hard. And we can't do this alone. Without this funding, we will not be able to provide the critical services needed to keep our children safe. It does not increase taxes, and it allows us to continue to provide some critical services, but also um, some very cutting edge services. Like you said, I run our volunteer and mentoring program. We're one of the few in the country that have it. And I have seen children come in our doors, experiencing one thing and walking out, um, becoming children at promise. So thank you so much for your support on behalf of our board, our staff, our families, but most importantly, the children we serve and are accountable to. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, uh, may I get a motion for adoption? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Are there any comments by our elected officials' offices? Yes. Hi there. Um, Auditor Kilgore is unable to make it tonight, so um, she did want me to provide uh, an update on the most recent bond sale. Yeah. Um, so we, we had um, our bond sale on October 1st and 2nd. Total sale was just over $350 million. So um, of that, $309 million um, in bonds was issued for new capital projects. Um, and the remaining amount, so about $43 million, was refunded at lower interest rates. Um, resulting in a total of about $4.5 million in savings for the city. So it's really exciting for us. Um, as many of you know, we launched our Invest in Us campaign in 2018 in order to make it easier for individuals and retail buyers to purchase the city's bonds. Um, so last year we saw 30% of the total sale go to retail. Um, so these are mom pop shops, as Auditor Kilgore likes to call them, or individual investors. Um, and this year we saw 37% of the total sale go to individual or retail purchasers. So um, great success there. Thank you guys for your support in that initiative. Um, the transaction is closing this week, so we will actually have data um, in the next few days on uh, where in the region the bonds were purchased, and at that time we'll share more. So thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any other comments from our elected officials offices? Are there any requests uh, by members of council for the removal of an ordinance or resolution from the consent portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of titles of 30-day legislation? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Will the clerk now read into the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation for first reading? Finance Committee, Ordinance 2565-2019, Public Utilities Committee, Ordinance 2412-2019, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 2456, 2460, and 2462-2019, Housing Committee, Ordinance 2630-2019. Thank you, uh, Madam <coughs> Clerk. Uh, we have one speaker on the, uh, actually that's consent. We only have, oh, well, does, do any council members have any uh, comments on the first reading portion of the agenda? Council member Favor. 
Thank you, President Hardin. I'd actually like to um, say a few words on ordinance number 2630-2019. Um, it speaks specifically to the Central Ohio Area Agency. Um, earlier this year, council passed an ordinance to support our senior residents aging in place through the funding of COAAA. The program supported preventative efforts to reduce eviction, displacement, and homelessness amongst our senior population. We have since learned that there is still an incredible need for this type of support to help keep our aging residents from a housing crisis. I'd like to invite Cindy Farson, the director of COAAA, and her team to the podium to talk a little bit more about this programming and the immediate need for additional support. Good evening, President Hardin, uh, President Pro Tem Brown, Housing Chair Favor. We are delighted to accept this $50,000 grant. Um, at the core of what we do at Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging um, is provide services and information to keep people in the home and the community for as long as they want to be there. And um, housing is really primary to that. Um, if you can't have safe housing, if you can't maintain that housing, you can't get services and stay there. Um, so I want to just introduce Lynn Dobb, who um, heads up our information referral and education team. And I want Pat Scott, who really developed the pilot and uh, specializes in housing. I would like her to say a few words about the program. Thank you, Cindy. Council President Shannon Harden, Pro Tem Brown, and Councilwoman Favor, and Council members. As an information, thank you. As an information assistance specialist at the Area Agency on Aging, my colleagues and I have been challenged with identifying some viable resources to assist our Columbus citizens, senior citizens, with rent. Prior to being awarded the pilot funds in March of this year, resources for financial rental assistance were sparse, and oftentimes funds were limited, contributing only 10 to 15 percent toward the total rent cost which is not enough to avoid eviction and in some cases homelessness. With funds utilized to pilot the housing assistance program known as HAP, we now have a new narrative of hope for those seeking rent assistance. From the, from the inception of HAP, 42 senior citizens age 50 and older and with median incomes between $700 and $900 per month received help for their rent. 85% of those applicants were women. Many of our applicants were confronted with hardships due to the rising cost of health care and job loss. A typical caller requesting rent assistance would often comment, this is the first time I have ever had to ask for help. I don't want to become homeless. With your allocation of funds, our new narrative is, let's talk about how we can help. That response alone would not be possible without your financial support. By stabilizing housing for our senior citizens, we can begin to assess and assist with additional qualifying community resources and benefits such as SNAP or food stamps, utility assistance programs, and wraparound services such as home delivered meals, food boxes, homemaker and home health aid services. Consequently, we can now begin to address not only rent assistance, but we also the overall needs of the household. Moving forward, our, your generous support of $50,000 will enable us to continue the work to assist our most vulnerable citizens in Columbus. The funds you provided to the Area Agency on Aging will enable us to intervene during the eviction process and prevent the trajectory of an eviction. Your financial assistance enriches the lives of our senior citizens, supports caregivers and families, and strengthens our community. Thank you so much for your generosity. Absolutely. Thank you, President Harden, for just obliging. And just as a personal side, this is just first reading, yeah. uh, but I just want to thank you, the three of you, for your advocacy and the work that you're doing uh, to address the need of our seniors as it relates to housing in, in Central Ohio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The following orders appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those into the record, please? Finance Committee Ordinances 2373, 2416, 2419, 
2442, 2445, and 2485-2019. Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinance 2360-2019. Public Safety Committee Ordinances 2385, 2475, and 2529-2019. Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 1080, 2372, 2386, 2437, 2444, 2505, and 2588 2019 Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinances 2374, 2388, and 2515-2019. Housing Committee Ordinance 2594-2019. Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee Ordinance 2501-2019. Economic Development Committee Resolution 284-X-2019. Ordinances 2509, 2510, 2511, 2602, 2691-2019. Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinances 2313, 2481-2586-2019, and appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0179-2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have one speaker on the consent portion of the agenda, Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins. Uh, welcome back to Council. Mr. Wilkins is speaking on Ordinance 2544, I believe, 2594 in the Housing Committee. Wilkins, welcome back to council. Sixteen twelve Arlington Avenue, Mr. Latay George Wilkins, as a resident of North Linden. Um, uh, speaking on uh, four ninety six Linwood Avenue, and I got several questions why I'm against this property. It's holding the uh, the uh, Oakwood area. I think since 2018. And I believe the uh, Central Ohio Community Investment had took over this property, uh, I believe in July of 2019. Um, this property has sit vacant for a very long time in the Oak East neighborhood. And I just wanted to say why I'm against this. This, is, this home was built in 1910, also a four-bedroom house that sat vacant time after time after time again. I understand that the city takes these properties, hold them in the land bank, Central Ohio Community Investment, and turns it over to the city of Columbus. I know as I do, as I looked at my documentation over several years, that it doesn't give any property owners or any resident contractors to really look at to stabilize some of these older homes. And I would tell you that I'm against this for several reasons. We also talk about the mental health facilities and houses. Houses that sit like this time and time again. We, we, we look at this for 2010. Why is not a for sale sign? Why is not a, a 30% in decrease of the amount of a land bank property. 2010, 2014, why does not a land, why does not a for sale sound to decrease $40,000 of a house that sits in the land bank? As I, as I came down here, I had to pull this stuff up from the library. And to understand, this house continually to still sit it has special type of signing. We will not find another home like this with some type of special indications on the outside of this property. And, and again, as I, as I looked at the Franklin County Auditor's website, there's several people that own this property. It was listed for 14 8 at a time. And, and all of them had listed as zero set one. And I, you know, and I just don't understand why are we continually to tear down these homes that has good bones? And, you know, I just wanted to say, as I was in front of my TV, I looked at what you call flip this home. But we, we can flip some of these homes to bring job opportunities. I hear a lot of times that people are just acts of violence or crime. What would do something with these houses to bring annual opportunity again to these homes? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your advocacy, Mr. Uh, Wilkins. Um, really would be interested in uh, a specific conversation around our land bank property strategies and, and housing. I know that there are several programs that we do have um, that work with folks to rehab, uh, but maybe it's time to have that conversation. I thought that was uh, pretty poignant, so thank you. 
Are there any other questions or comments on the consent portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may I get a motion? Uh, uh, may I get a motion for approval of these items uh, designated as consent? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Consent portion of the agenda is passed. We will now proceed with the second reading of 30 day legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Finance Committee, chaired by President Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. In uh, finance tonight, we have ordinance. 2689-2019 to authorize and direct uh, the mayor of the city of Columbus to accept a grant from Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund Incorporated to authorize the appropriation of $20,000 from the unappropriated balance of the, of the private grant fund and to declare an emergency. Earlier this year, I partnered with Mayor Ginther and the Columbus Women's Commission to apply for this grant. As a commissioner of the Women's Commission myself, I am grateful for the leadership role they are taking on this important issue. And this is a truly important issue in our community. The Urban Institute found that 57% of Columbus families are financially insecure with less than $2,000 in savings, while 42% of residents have some subprime credit scores, 42%. The existence of financial insecurity creates significant costs to the city as we work to help families access basic necessities like stable housing, food, and transportation. When families struggle to make ends meet, addressing their needs is important. And we should also focus attention on combating the causes of their financial struggles. Our goal with this CFE grant is to create a community plan for the financial empowerment of women and families in particular as women are growing heads of household in families across the country and right here in Columbus. I am excited that Columbus is one of seven cities selected to receive this funding. We are working to build on the network of services currently available through community partners like the Columbus Urban League and Impact Community Action and others to strengthen credit scores, improve access to credit and banking services, and to provide household budgeting assistance and planning. The best way to understand the needs of all women is to engage directly with individuals and community partners throughout Columbus, basing our strategy on the lived experiences of the people who are most affected amplifies the impact of these financial empowerment efforts. With technical support and guidance from the CFE fund, these dollars will help us convene a series of briefings with stakeholders in a boot camp that brings together key local constituencies. At the end of this process, we will craft a blueprint for families based on the needs of residents and partnership opportunities with various organizations in the community. I want to thank Mayor Ginther, Shannon Ginther, and Shelley Biding with the Columbus Women's Commission for partnering with me on this initiative. I also want to thank Kelsey Ellingson and Karina Johnson for their um, great assistance in securing this grant for us, again, one of seven cities across the country. The success and vitality of Columbus as a whole is directly linked to the financial security of its families. I'm very excited to move forward this, with this work. Any questions for my colleague? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. That's all I have in my committees, President Harden. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, council, uh, next committee to come before council is the Public Safety Committee. The committee is chaired by Councilmember Mitch Brown. Councilmember Flores Joris. Thank you, Council President. I have one ordinance in Public Safety Committee this evening. I'd like to ask Deputy Police Chief Michael Woods and Ms. Angela Plummer from the Community Refugee and Immigration Services to please approach the podium. Ordinance 2655 2019 to appropriate approximately $20,000 within the Public Safety Initiative subfund for the Department of Public Safety on behalf of the Division of Police to purchase additional cell phones and associated equipment and to declare an emergency. This ordinance allocates funding to purchase an additional cell phones to be used by patrol sergeants in order to access the division's interpretation services. These devices will be another tool for them to facilitate communication between first responders and the residents that they are serving. I'd like to recognize my colleague, uh, Emmanuel Remy, for his co-sponsorship of this ordinance and is committed to ensuring equal access to Columbus New America residents. Councilmember, if you'd like to have a few comments. Sure, thank you very much, Councilmember Brown. I'd like to uh, just highlight that this is a really true example of, of somebody identifying a problem, bringing it to us uh, with Chris and, and Angie Plummer 
coming to us and st stating the problem and really us working together as council members, uh, being responsive and, and trying to come up with a solution. Um, like to thank Deputy Chief Woods for his leadership and working to make sure that you know we have an ability to communicate with our residents no matter what language that they speak and uh, at the time of an incident and it's not delayed because we're trying to find ways to communicate through a translator. So. Um, we are committed, this council is committed to making sure that every resident in the city of Columbus has the opportunity to communicate with the, the government that serves them. And so this is just one step in that direction. So we're very thankful uh, for the opportunity to provide this and look forward to seeing the results moving down the road. So thank you very much, Councilmember Brown, for your leadership, and I'm excited to join you on this project. Thank you. Any other comments from any of my other colleagues? Deputy Chief Woods. Uh, thank you. Uh, President Harden, uh, President Pro Tem Brown, Chair Brown, uh, members of council. In 2018, the Division of Police worked with our contracted uh, interpretation services nearly 3,000 times. This year, we're averaging approximately 250 contacts per month with normally over 15 different languages and dialects needing assistance. In cases involving detectives, those are usually handled uh, in an office setting, prearranged and over the phone. It's a much easier uh, situation. Patrol officers, however, often need interpretation services that can be conducted in the field and over the phone. Currently, each of our 20 precincts only has one phone that serves as both the domestic violence lethality assessment phone and the phone to contact and interpretation services. These new phones will enhance our capabilities by providing one additional phone per precinct that will be assigned to an officer but available for every officer on that precinct. The phones are going to be pre-programmed with contact numbers, making contact easy. Technical issues will be reported and corrected through our headquarters operations section, and the police business office will continue to maintain information on our services to include the number of times we contact them, the total time we're on the phone, and the languages encountered. We think that this is another step in providing services in an area that uh, we need some additional assistance in. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Ms. Plummer, can you provide some background on the access to the translation services we have as far as your clients are concerned? Uh, yes, thank you, Councilmember Brown. Um, good evening, President Harden, uh, President Pro Tem Brown, uh, Councilmember M. Brown, <laughs> and the <laughs> Councilmember Brown. Brown. We, we, we <laughs> go together. It's cool. <laughs> um, thank you so much for in, inviting me to give remarks tonight. Um, I had well, one of Chris's main programs is to provide services to crime victims who are um, immigrants and refugees, and I'd hoped our uh, program manager, Laura Downing, would be here this evening because it was really Laura working on the ground with people, providing feedback, continuously pushing me um, to then push city officials to, to take a look at this issue. Um, providing these cell phones to law enforcement officers for purposes of accessing interpretation is a crucial first step to improve language access for all Columbus residents enabling consistent response by police to victims with limited, limited English proficiency. When any person calls the police for help during a violent incident in the home, they have a right to unbiased, qualified interpretation and to know they will not be asked to rely on the perpetrator, their children, or a neighbor to convey their words fully and accurately to the officer. Anything less than that puts the victims, the responding officers, and the community at greater risk. The same is true for someone reporting a sexual assault, a car accident, filing a noise complaint. Um, they have a right to equitable protection and justice under the law, and I thank council and the police department for uh, working with us as an important step towards this goal. We're confident that our city, and a shout out to Sandra Lopez for also moving this forward, um, our police department will continue to make improvements, expanding training in working with refugees and immigrants, recruiting officers and other civil servants who reflect the diversity of Columbus residents, and increasing transparency and accountability which contribute to building a positive relationship between law enforcement and all Columbus residents. Our city is safest and justice best served when all residents and law enforcement can effectively communicate with each other. Chris applauds these efforts by city council to make language access for limited English speakers a reality. Thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, you did touch upon someone who I neglected to mention, that is Sandra, who has done a superb job in communicating the ideas and the ideals of this council to members throughout the city as far as the diversity. And she's done a super job. So yes. uh, if there are no further comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Harden. Passed. That's all I have this evening, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next committee to come before council is the Neighborhoods Committee, chaired by Councilmember Doran. Councilmember Flores Doris. Thank you, President Harden. Um, so we have one piece of legislation for neighborhoods this evening. That's ordinance number 2676-2019 to authorize uh, Columbus City Council to enter into a co contract with Reading Holiday Project, Inc. to renew and expand support of the Barbershop Books Program and to authorize an, an appropriation expenditure within the neighborhood initiative subfund and declare emergency. Um, would like to turn this back over to you, President Harden, here in a second, but would we'll want to thank sure. you and the Council President Pro Tem Brown's leadership in providing these funds to keep the Barbership Books program alive in 30 different barbershops around the city. Uh, if it weren't for the two of you um, and, and the work that you've done, um, this program may not be where it's at today. So I think I speak for all of us here at City Council to say thank you for doing so. So with that, President Harden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and certainly want to thank President Pro Tem for continued partnership on the Barbershop Books program. Um, we're just really excited to continue funding this program. I think we are in our fourth, third or fourth year, fourth year of funding this program. Now we have the largest Barbershop Books program in the country. Um, it, the goal is simple, is to make sure that our young people, and specifically young boys and young boys of color, um, say three words, I'm a reader. Uh, and uh, using cultural competent books uh, in a place like uh, a barbershop is so important. And so working with the great um, barbers uh, uh, and working with the Columbus City Schools has, has been really good um, with a small investment. I think that we're having a big impact. And so thank you for your leadership. Councilmember Brown, would you, do you have any additional comments? Yeah, I mean, I would just add um, my thanks and especially to President Hardin for introducing this innovative way to encourage our youngest residents to read. Um, and it, the program works. You, you led a tour uh, a few months ago of a few barbershops I, I attended and some community folks along with the schools. And um, we learned a lot about the statistics. You know, 73% of uh, boys were, quote, never reading in these shops before, as self-reported by the barbers. And afterwards, barbers report that 91% of them either see boys reading daily or almost every day, which is incredible. Um, so those are the stats that say it works. But I think what was more informative was actually when we showed up um, at these barber shops, and they didn't all know we were coming. Uh -uh. And uh, there were young people, young boys, um, and, and some girls yeah. there, um, too, reading the books um, while their, their parents uh, were, were there. And it was really cool to see. Um, so thank you for your leadership on it, and I look forward to further years of it. Thank you. And I would just like to shout out um, the Columbus City Schools and the lead on it was uh, Dr. Keisha Hunley Jenkins, uh, who had brought the program to uh, the city and has been a, a shepherd while uh, while she's been at the school district. So thank you, uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you, President Pro Tem. Uh, thank you. With that, I would move for adoption or uh, move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favorite, Remy, President Harden. Adopt it. Thank you, um, President Harden. With your permission, can I move on to Technology Committee? Please. Thank you. Um, I have ordinance number 2514-2019 to authorize the Director of Finance and Management on behalf of the Department of Technology uh, to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate state term schedule with CDW Government LLC for, the, for, for procurement of Cisco VoIP license renewal, maintenance, and support to transfer $587,397 within the information Services Operating Fund to provide sufficient funding for this transaction and to authorize the expenditure of $1,137,397.80 from the Information Services Division, Information Services Operating Fund, and to declare emergency. Uh, Cisco has been established as the citywide standard for our voice over internet protocol environment, better known as the office phones utilized by all the city departments. 
The city migrated to Cisco VoIP telephone solution with the goal of dramatically saving on increased costs related to aged telephone services by the traditional carriers that used copper wire. The Cisco phones have been widely deployed throughout the city and continued efforts remain in place to depreciate existing aged phones and our phone systems. Uh, this initiative will actually save the city more than $1 million due to the long-term nature of the contract. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the row. Brown, Brown, Dorans, favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you, President Harden. That's all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next committee comes for council is the Public Pardon. Service Committee. The committee is chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember Floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Tonight in Public Service and Transportation, we have Ordinance Number 2520-2019 to appropriate funds within the Federal Transportation Grants Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with Columbus Asphalt Paving for the Pedestrian Safety Improvements SRTS Sidewalks, McGuffey and Duxbury PID 100964 project to authorize the expenditure of up to $492,075 in the Federal Transportation Grants Fund and $27,703.52 in the Streets and Highways Bond Fund for the project and to declare an emergency. This ordinance represents a safe routes to school sidewalk installation in which sidewalks will be constructed on both sides of Duxbury from Lexington Avenue to Hamilton Avenue where gaps occur between existing sidewalks and along McGuffey Road from Duxbury Avenue to the end of the existing sidewalk just north into Clinton Street. These sidewalks will serve students in the Linden community walking to and from school at both Hamilton STEM Academy and Lyndon McKinley STEM Academy. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I would move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. That's all I have in my committee. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The next committee to come for council is the Economic Development Committee. The committee is chaired by Councilman Remy. Councilman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. Tonight I have Ordinance number 2504-2019 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with RM Biltright LLC and Watkins Road LLC for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately $11.47 million, the creation of 40 net new full-time permanent positions and the retention of one full-time job. Based out of Sandy Springs, Georgia, RM Viltrite is a company that specializes in the manufacturing distribution of rubber sheeting, matting, flooring, thermoplastics, and a wide variety of industrial rubber products. The company offices are located in the USA, Netherlands, China, India, and Thailand, while their thermoplastics manufacturing facility is located in Chelsea, Massachusetts. RM Biltright has over 185 years of combined experience with the design, development, and the contract manufacturing of a large assortment of rubber and plastic products. Watkins Road LLC is a real estate holding company that was recently formed for the purposes of acquiring, owning, developing, and selling real estate. RM Biltright and Watkins Road LLC are proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately $11,470,500, which includes $4,705,500 in acquisition costs, $1,650,000 in real property improvements, $5 million in machinery and equipment, $100,000 in furniture and fixtures, and $15,000 in standalone computers to acquire, renovate, redevelop a vacant industrial warehouse distribution facility consisting of approximately 177,566 square feet at 1635 Watkins Road. RM Biltright will be the tenant employer of record and enter into a lease agreement with Watkins Road LLC to expand and relocate its operations facility to the proposed project site. Additionally, the company will retain, retain one full-time employee with an associated annual payroll of approximately $85,000 and create 40 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $1,677,740 at the project site. I'd like to turn it over to the director to have for some further comments on this piece of legislation. Director Stevens. Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Remy, members of the City Council. Uh, we're pleased to bring forward this strategic investment incentive to you because of a, a couple key reasons. One, we are taking a vacant property down the Marion Franklin neighborhood and having a buyer come in, redevelop it, and from changing it from warehouse space to manufacturing facility. 
that will offer jobs. It's also critical to note that over the 20, next 20 years, the city school district will receive approximately $423,000 in property tax, as well as an additional $192,000 in revenue sharing over the term of the abatement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Seeing no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Next, I'd like to invite Ben Texler, President of Coastal Ridge Real Estate Partners, to come down as I read Ordinance Number 2561-2019 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into a downtown office incentive agreement with Coastal Ridge Real Estate Partners, LLC, Coastal Ridge Management, LLC, PPG Management, LLC, and Fox and Insurance Company, LLC. Founded in 2013, Coastal Ridge Estate Partners is a full-service investment management firm focused on the multifamily real estate sector. CRRE, as they're also known, concentrates on acquiring niche multifamily real estate assets, including student housing, senior housing, and market rate housing located throughout the United States. CRM, Coastal Ridge Management, is the common paymaster for CRRE. Founded in 2009, Peak Property Group is a full-service private real estate investment management company specializing in residential property in Columbus and Cincinnati areas. I'm gonna let you go ahead and speak because you could probably speak better than I can even read. So I'll let you speak about the company and tell us a little bit more about what this ordinance is about. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Council President Hardin, Council Pro, Pro Temp Brown, uh, and Council members. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. Uh, my name's Ben Texler, and I'm the president and a partner at Coastal Ridge uh, Real Estate Partners, a private real estate investment and management firm founded, based, and grown in central Ohio. Uh, as a Columbus, Ohio native, I can speak on behalf of our partnership in regards to our tremendous gratitude for your interest and consideration of supporting our proposed expansion project in downtown Columbus. Uh, more specifically, Coastal Ridge Real Estate, along with Peak Property Group, operates as a full-service real estate firm focused on the acquisition and management of institutional multifamily real estate assets, including conventional multifamily, private student housing, and active adult communities located throughout the United States. In addition, based on the needs related to renter's liability coverage, we launched Fox and Insurance Company in 2017, which was built to provide risk management products and solutions for the benefits of residents, managers, and owners. We've experienced significant growth over the past six years and are on pace and eager to continue this trend in a sound manner. Coastal Ridge is proud to have received numerous awards in recent years, including being named one of Columbus's Fast 50. As such, we've outgrown our current offices and began a site search to accommodate our current and planned operations. The proposed expansion project location is 80s on the Commons, uh, in which we're interested in leasing 60,000 square feet on the first floor. Uh, this particular location is attractive as it is expected to significantly aid in recruiting top tier industry talent, but will also better position our respective companies for future expansion. Uh, respectfully, the location is not the lowest cost option, and the incentive package offered by the state and the city of Columbus helps to equalize the cost of expanding in Columbus when compared to other locations. We'd like to thank you again for consideration of incentive support for a proposed project. We value the City of Columbus, One Columbus, Jobs Ohio for their assistance. Anthony Slappy and the City's economic development team efforts to help us through this process are truly appreciated. With that, again, I'd like to express our gratitude for your partnership in permitting us to humbly be a part of Columbus's continued excellence and growth and I'm pleased to answer any questions on behalf of our organization. I think one of the most important things to recognize here is, is that this legislation and your relocating to that spot will create 80 net new full-time permanent positions with an annual payroll of 6,138,700, retain and ro relocate 75 full-time positions with an estimated annual payroll of $5,793,200, $5, uh, with which will be new jobs to the city but not incentivized. So it's an incredible um, success story. We appreciate having you come into the city and, and create those jobs. Um, Director, did you have anything you'd like to speak? 
President Hardin, Chair Ramey, members of council, I want to thank Ben for coming down. And I also want to emphasize the fact that we worked hard not only to get 80 new jobs, but we retained 75 jobs in the city in Columbus, and so that's important to work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments um, from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. Thanks again, Mr. Tex. I appreciate it. That's all I have this evening in economic development. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seeing no further business to come before council, may I get a motion for adjournment? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Council is now adjourned.